Okay, so now we're going to put these two pieces together that we learned in the last unit. We're going to put supply and demand together. But we're going to go beyond just supply and demand crossing each other, coming up with price and quantity. We'll do that too. But one of the reasons we go through all the work of deriving cost functions and figuring out sort of the individual decision making of a firm is that the standard supply and demand model, the perfect competition model, can actually tell us a lot more than just what the price is and what the quantity is. It can tell us a lot about the individual decision making of firms and about the number of firms in the market and so on, the size of firms, and that's what we're going to study in this unit. Okay. Before we can do that, we got to talk about the large number of assumptions that are necessary for this model to hold perfectly. Now, in practice, these assumptions never hold exactly, but they do hold approximately, to an approximate degree, enough of the time that this is a really useful model to know. It's a really good first pass at sort of any economic situation. There's lots of situations where the assumptions are violated and and violated so strongly that you might need another model, and we're going to cover those models later. But let's start with the assumptions for the perfect competition model. So the first one is that firms have increasing marginal cost. So firms have, there we go. If not, we get into some trouble about firms might have an incentive to lower their prices because then they can undercut their rivals and if they can undercut their rivals they can sell more units and more units are cheaper to produce than the ones before and so on okay but if we have increasing marginal costs then you don't really face this issue uh, the other the second one is that there are many firms and many consumers such that Prices are exogenous to any one firm or consumer. What do I mean by that? Remember, exogenous says like taken as given. Uh, they're not uh, choice variables. And so what this is saying is that there are so many other people buying uh, and so many other people selling that nobody has like buying power or selling leverage that they can set the price. Um, they can't sort of set the price for the whole industry. And instead, everybody takes the price as given and doesn't try to influence it. Okay. And the reason they don't try to influence it is because they're too small to have any effect on it. The third assumption is that firms uh, produce identical goods. which means that the only thing people care about is, you know, the price and that they take, you know, we can add all of their goods together into just a market quantity. We don't have to worry about like the difference between the product from one sells from two, from three, from four. And this is, you know, this is uh, actually unrealistic in most settings. Most firms sell slightly different types of goods. Okay. Even the location that you buy the good could be a way to differentiate yourself, okay? So gas is gas, but you might be able to charge a different price if you're right next to a convenient place versus if you're way out there, okay? But again, assumptions are close enough to true that this is a useful model. Four, uh, firms and consumers have identical information. So what does that mean? Like uh, nobody, there's not side dealing. Uh, there's not different prices for different people and so on. Okay. Five. In the long run, firms have the same technology. So except for like a very special circumstance. This model implies that it's not really possible for firms to coexist with very different types of cost function. In the short run they can and we went through some examples of how you would build up a supply curve from firms with different cost functions. But in the long run uh, firms are going to end up having identical technology and to cut to the chase it's going to be that like 
whichever technology is sort of the most cost effective is the only one that can survive. Lastly, we've got free entry and free exit. So entry means uh, the entry of new firms into the market, so starting new businesses. Exit means the departure of firms from the market, so bankruptcy, closing down, and doing something else. And essentially we're saying that there's no you know, legal or whatever impediment to doing that. If it's profitable to enter, firms can enter. If it's not profitable to stay in the market, they can leave. And if we have all these six assumptions, we can use our perfect competition model. Before we jump straight into it, though, we need to in, we need to zero in on one aspect of cost for firms that we have so far neglected, which is average cost.